Fin Crime Investigations, Jennifer here. What can I help you find? Interesting. I'm sorry to hear you've been affected by mortgage fraud. Can you tell me a bit more? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Now, when you spoke to the neighbors, did they say whether or not anyone had come in and out of the property during daylight hours? No. Okay. Now, what about the renovations? You said those happened around the time of purchase about two years ago. Are they finished yet? No. Do they look nice? Sounds like shoddy workmanship. And what about, you said you saw this elsewhere in the neighborhood? Sort of the similar poor workmanship? Hmm. Sounds like organized crime might be involved. Okay, I've seen this before. Let me do some digging and I'll get back to you. First, let's go through our case notes together. The caller described a residential home with multiple sales over a short period, each sale inflating the value until about two years ago. Neighbors have never seen the owner. Renovations were begun around the time of the purchase date, and they're still ongoing. That's almost two years long. The renovations appear to be made of poor quality materials and workmanship. Neighbors notice lights on in the property at night, but no one going in and out of the house during the day. The house is starting to look dilapidated. The caller said the residential property was appraised at or above market value. The caller has not seen a mortgage payment in two months, so they gave me a call. Sadly, this story is familiar to me. I started investigating mortgage fraud almost 20 years ago, and one of my first cases involved a biker gang. It's that case that might help us shed some light on how we might investigate this one. It was the early 2000s, and the mortgage crisis had not yet happened. People were happily going about their lives, buying homes they wouldn't be able to afford. Prices were high, interest rates were low. What a great time for criminals to blend into the crowd, hiding their ill-gotten gains in the real estate market. They could then launder extra funds through renovations, mortgage payments, and the subsequent early discharge of the mortgage and the sale of the property. As an investigator looking at mortgage files, I would often be called to review a file once payments had ceased. In this case, we had someone who had stopped paying, but who kept promising to pay later. What caught my eye when I reviewed the file was where the property was located, an area known to be controlled by organized crime and affiliated with a mortgage broker dubbed the paper mill. I took the case. I started by looking for commonalities with other non-paying mortgages. The paper mill was rumored to create any employment document a borrower might need to prove their income and ongoing ability to pay a mortgage. I went back and I reviewed the borrower's tax assessments for formatting errors the paper mill was known for. Things like alignment, fonts, decimals out of place. It doesn't sound sexy, but there it was staring me in the face. The borrower's tax assessments had been created and fabricated by the paper mill. So good for us, we found fake documents, but my client had already lent the funds and the borrower had no intention of giving them back. In fact, every time we tried to contact him, he would duck our calls and he was becoming increasingly hard to find. When he stopped responding, we did two things. We contacted the mortgage agent that had referred the borrower because he should know his client and we compared his tax assessments to others we had on file. Tens of other files were found with the same formatting errors on their tax assessments, often coming through the same mortgage agent and real estate agent. And guess what? We found another 50 files that use the same closing solicitor and often use the same appraiser. What we were starting to realize was that this was not the story of just one home, but of many, affecting the home values of an entire suburb. This wasn't just a story of home values, it was one of safety too. We were starting to realize that we are knee deep in a biker gang operation. A quick review of the purchase agreement on file demonstrated some rather creative penmanship. Changes to the purchase price had been made to artificially inflate the home's value, as well as creating extra room for criminals to insert their funds into the financial system. How did they do that? 
They had a purchaser come with, let's say, 120,000 on the offer to purchase. The seller would counter with an offer lower, and the final offer would come back from the purchaser at an even higher price than the original offer. It just didn't make sense. At this point, I had to try and figure out whether we were more down the path of money laundering with criminals trying to insert ill-gotten gains into the financial system, or more down the path of simple mortgage fraud looking for an inflated value and possibly an inflated mortgage value so that the criminal could abscond with those funds. I had to figure it out. We plotted out hundreds of properties with appraisals supposedly done by this one appraiser. We realized that it would have taken an Olympian to perform all of these properties in one day. I started to call around. Turns out the appraiser was retired and 96 years old. As well, the closing solicitor was rumored to be sketchy. It left little for us to go on in terms of proving that he had knowingly accepted falsified documents. But we did know one thing. When a crummy file came through, it had passed across his desk and we often had difficulty getting in touch with his clients. So these documents the borrower had relied upon, the purchase and sale agreement, the income tax documents, the ID verified by the solicitor and the appraiser were all fake or fabricated in some way. We decided to start civil proceedings. We started with an Anton Pillar order and a Mariva injunction, and this gave us access to the house, the laptop on which the borrower kept his business plans, and a chance to chat with the borrower directly. Oh, the things we learned. First about the house. Neighbors mentioned they had seen several people taking wheelbarrows in and out of the house with something in it, primarily going into the basement. Renovations had gone on on the property around the time of purchase, and they were included in the inflated sales price. No sign of those. The buyer did spend part of his time at the property, though. When we looked at his laptop, we noticed detailed plans on a recovered, deleted Excel file entitled Vineyards. These clearly related to the yields he was expecting on his grow up. Oh, and there were squatters staying in the property. This gave the borrower a chance to have someone provide valuable oversight over the assets in the basement while he wasn't around. It also prevented nosy neighbors from checking in on what was going on. Next, we sat down with the buyer for discovery. He was nervous, he was sweaty, he couldn't look up, and he kept having to take a break. He claimed that he knew nothing about the mortgage broker, or very little, he had only met him once, the real estate agent, and he may or may not have known the appraiser. He wasn't sure was frustrating. We broke regularly so that he could use his phone. We thought he might be associated with biker gang activity in the region, and this further strengthened our hunch. He was unfazed by the civil suit going on right in front of him, but clearly he was concerned with keeping the person on the other end of the phone pleased with what he was saying. We technically knew enough about the buyer, the house, and the neighborhood, but ultimately it was understanding the business models of the buyer, including the grow up, the counterfeit documents, and the overinflated purchase price that led us to implementing stricter protocols against collusion at the client, as well as delivering new and updated document validation training. I wanted to send a clear message that my client would not be used for fraud and to stop a trend rippling through the industry. The costs of the investigation were mounting, the mortgage crisis hit, and my client, the bank, had other concerns to deal with the case was put on hold. But similar mortgage fraud schemes continue to this day, almost 20 years later. And here we have another one. So was it worth it? Could you have caught the bad guy? Tell me in the comments below. I need to get back to my client here. I think I know what to do next. Subscribe to my channel and I'll share my next case with you. Take care.